Welcome to the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences Scientific Awards presentation and a lecture by Dr. Jack Szostak as a part of the Kościuszko Foundation Collegium of Eminent Scientists lecture series. Let me introduce the participants of today's online ceremony and lecture. Uh, Dr. Robert Blobaum, President of the Polish Institute of Art and Sciences of America. Dr. Blobaum, thank you for your cooperation in organizing this event. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hanna Chrobocza Kelker, Kościuszko Foundation Trustee, Chair of the Kazimir Funk Natural Sciences Award Selection Committee at the Polish Institute of Art and Sciences of America. Dr. Zbigniew Darzynkiewicz, a Kościuszko Foundation trustee and the chairman of the Kościuszko Foundation Collegium of Eminent Scientists of Polish Ancestry and Origin. Dr. Wlodek Mandeski, a Kościuszko Foundation trustee and the chair of the Tadeusz Sędzimir Applied Sciences Award Selection Committee at the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America. And the award honorees, Dr. Halina Zyczyński and Dr. Jack Szostak. My sincere congratulations to both of you. The honorees, Dr. Zyczyński and Dr. Szostak are also members of the Kościuszko Foundation Collegium of Eminent Scientists of Polish Origin and Ancestry. The Collegium was established seven years ago and brings recognition to the achievements of its members. As of today, there are nearly 450 members. The goals of the initiative are to honor eminent scientists of Polish origin and ancestry who have achieved recognition in the, U in the United States, to recognize, highlight, and publicize the achievements of individual scientists, to identify and record eminent Polish scientists and scientists of Polish descent residing in America. The compendium will be of interest of future scientists, historian, and Polish organizations. Scientists honored by, the, by election to the Collegium are recognized as distinguished fellows of the Collegium. If any of you know someone who qualifies, please, con please contact the Kościuszko Foundation. You can find more about the Collegium on our website. Now, let me give the floor to Dr. Blobaum. I just want to thank uh, Professor Skulimowski uh, uh, for these introductions, and I also want to thank him personally uh, uh, and uh, the Kosciuszko Foundation uh, for pro providing this virtual platform today for today's event. And uh, I specifically want to thank Eva Zadvona uh, for her hard work in, in putting us all together, uh, bringing us all together uh, this afternoon. Uh, that was no easy feat, and, the, uh, and uh, uh, technology always has its challenges, and it, it continues to have its challenges this afternoon. Uh, but uh, I, I want to thank Ava uh, for doing all of the, the, the hard work to bring us together. Uh, the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America uh, is an organization that goes back to, to the Second, uh, Second World War. Uh, actually, it was founded in the middle of the war in, in 1943. Uh, and some uh, 52 years later, it, it, this, or, this organization inaugurated its, its awards. Uh, these awards were in history. Uh, the humanities, uh, 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 minus history, but basically literature and the fine arts, uh, uh, social sciences, uh, uh, natural sciences, and, and applied sciences. Uh, and the purpose of these awards was to honor uh, distinguished scholars and scientists for, the, for their outstanding uh, achievements. Uh, the awards, fittingly enough, were named after the Institute's founders, in, in some cases, uh, and its historically most distinguished members in others, uh, including uh, Kashmir Funk and uh, Tadeusz uh, Sengemir. Uh, each year, award committees consider candidates in each of these categories, uh, with their recipients announced at the beginning of the following uh, year. 
Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Shostak and uh, Dr. Zaczynski have known since January, if not before, uh, that they had they had received these awards. Uh, our practice has been to formally present these uh, awards to the recipients in person. Uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, as we know, COVID has affected more than one uh, best laid plan. Uh, that is why I'm so grateful to the Kosciuszko Foundation for providing the Polish Institute with this opportunity to recognize our two science award recipients with some delay. Uh, and, uh, it, but also in front of their peers uh, in the Kosciuszko Foundation's Collegium uh, of Eminent Scientists. So, though I may not be among those peers, I'm a historian. Uh, uh, as president of the Polish Institute, I am uh, sincerely honored to, to interact with our award recipients uh, virtually instead of simply through email correspondence. Uh, uh, and uh, about the mailing addresses and where to send the certificates and, and the like. Uh, before I turn the screen over, I also wish to thank those who have rendered many years of service to our science award committees. Uh, Dr. Wodek Mandetsky uh, is chair of the Tadeusz Sendzimir uh, Applied Sciences Award Selection Committee. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hanna Krobocek uh, uh, Kelker. Uh, as chair of the Kazimierz Bunk uh, National Sciences Award Committee, and to Dr. Zbigniew Dajinkiewicz, uh, who has long served on, on both of them. Uh, so, without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Hrobocek uh, Kelker, who I hope has been able to, to sign in, uh, and uh, she will share with us a few words about the individuals for whom uh, these two awards are, are, are named. It is my pleasure to present to you a brief outline of careers and achievements of Tadeusz Sendzimir and of Kazimir Funk, outstanding and inspiring scientists. Tadeusz Sendzimir was born in 1894 in Lwów, Poland, where he studied the prestigious Lwów Technical University. At the age of 26, while working in Shanghai in a steel factory, he developed the process of hot dip galvanizing. He moved to the United States in mid 1930s when he developed another revolutionary technology, a rolling mill that could reduce very hard materials such as steel to very thin layers at ambient temperatures. He founded the successful T. Sengimir company in Connecticut. A rolling mill technology and machine design company has made a worldwide impact. Mr. Sanjimir developed 120 patents related to mining, metallurgy, and steelmaking. His patent on gal patents on galvanizing and rolling of steel were licensed worldwide. By the, year by the year 1980, his technology was adopted by 90% of world stainless steel production companies. His technology was also used for the development of lightweight machinery such as radar used for aircrafts, and the skin of Apollo spacecraft was manufactured on one of the Sengimir mills. Mr. Shenwi received many prestigious awards and honors in Europe and the United States. I'll mention only that the largest steel mill in Poland was renamed in his honor as Stadiusz Sengimir Steelworks. Tadeusz Sengimir was generous and enthusiastic supporter of Piazza, and of the Kosciuszko Foundation. He was a member of the Board of Trustees of the Kosciuszko Foundation of New York, for which he established funds for scholarships and for an award to young Polish innovators. Thank you. Now, Kazimierz Fung was born in Warsaw in 1884. He studied organic chemistry at the University of Bern, where he received his PhD at the age of 20. Subsequently, he conducted research at various prestigious European institutions. He's best known for his pioneering research that led to the discovery of vitamins and for the defining the role of vitamins in nutrition. It was 1911, at the age of 25, while at the Lister Institute in London, that he chose to study the cause of beriberi. 
This devastating disease is prevalent among people whose diet consists mainly of polished rice. Using an animal model, he demonstrated the symptoms of beriberi can be reversed by the administration of a substance he isolated from rice polishings, which he characterized as an amine. He introduced the term vitamin from beta, Latin, for life, and amine, and defined vitamins as a group of functionally related but structurally distinct substances that prevent development of nutritional deficiency diseases. This hypothesis has had a major impact on the direction in a field that was filled with controversy and developing science of nutrition, as well as on biochemistry and medicine. Kazimi's form also made important contribution to the fields of hormone research, enzymology, and chemical synthesis. After a distinguished scientific career, he settled in 1939 in New York, where he founded the Funk Foundation for Medical Research and served as a consultant to the U.S. Vitamin Corporation. He joined the newly founded Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America. Kazimir Funk Award honors and recognizes an outstanding natural scientist of Polish origin. Among the 13 previous recipients of the awards are many distinguished scientists, including three Nobel Prize laureates. Thank you very much. I don't know if I should wing it here. Perhaps we could uh, turn this over to a scientist. Dr. Dashinkiewicz uh, 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 or, or Dr. Mangetsky, do you want to do either one of you say, say a word about either? Thank you, Dr. Blavel. It is my great pleasure to introduce the recipient of the Saint-Jemir Award in Applied Sciences, Dr. Halina Zyczyński. She is currently a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Without hesitation, I can say that she is one of most visible recognized and distinguished Polish-American MDs in the US. First, a little bit of Dr. Zyczyński's educational background. She got her medical degree from Albany Medical College in New York, after which she joined University of Pittsburgh and the linked institution, the Pittsburgh McGee Women's Hospital, where she had internship and residency. Since 1999, she has been on the faculty there. Dr. Zyczyński's work touches many different aspects of women's health. She was instrumental in establishing a new field of urogynecology. In one person, we have a medical doctor treating patients and at the same time directing a university department and an institute. For treating patients, she was recognized by being placed several times on the list of the best doctors in the US. She also evaluates other doctors by serving on the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is also a scientist conducting medical research, applying, receiving, and supervising the work on grants, mostly from the NIH. She co-authored over 150 scientific papers, many in prestigious journals. She has participated in 15 clinical trials. Dr. Zuczyński is also a leader who builds and directs medical institutes and hospitals, including a brand new medical institute in Erie, Pennsylvania. She has been a very active member of medical societies, including the American Urogynecological Society, where she was president of the board. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce such an accomplished and well-rounded physician, a medical scientist, and a leader, and the recipient of 2019 Saint-Jemir Award. Dr. Blabaum. I just want to say that uh, I am, uh, as president of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America, uh, deeply honored to present to Dr. Zyczynski uh, the 2019 Tadeusz Sędzimir uh, Applied Sciences Award. 
uh, in recognition of her outstanding uh, uh, contributions to clinical research in uh, urogynecology. Uh, so Dr. Zaczynski, uh, could you share with us a few remarks of your own? It's certainly a very different field of science and thank God for the breadth of science that we can all enjoy and innovate in. I am, um, I am a clinical trialist, a clinician scientist who has dedicated the last 30 years to adding data actually to outcomes and treatment for women who have sustained childbirth injuries. And so the field of urogynecology is a very new field, and usually the founders are referred to as grandfathers. But <laughs> to some chromosomal aberration, there's a grandmother amongst the group. <laughs> um, and I'm really very uh, pleased and excited to have been part of the foundational knowledge, really, that uh, was uh, collected you know, over the last 30 years that um, has now built a new subspecialty in the field of obstetrics and gynecology, uh, that being urogynecology or reconstructive pelvic uh, medicine and surgery. Um, we aspire to provide clinicians with the data that they need to counsel women on their choices and to drive the agenda of value-based medicine interventions that are both cost-effective and ultimately lead to durable outcomes that improve the quality of women's lives. Um, there are certainly oncologists who work on longevity and survival uh, under the diagnosis of cancer. Our field is really focused on quality of life. I was blessed to have a grandmother who lived to be 101 and she shared with me over the years that I was growing up in college and medical school, what it's like to live in the body of an 80, 90, 100 year woman. And it, it was some of her insight actually that inspired me to work towards improving that quality of life. Women are the caregivers of their children, their spouses, their parents, as they get to be in that sandwich generation. And uh, the work that we do in urogynecology focuses on returning back uh, the, the dedication, the love, and the care that women deserve in their latter years of life. Uh, and I thank you for this award and the recognition that it comes with it. It's been an honor and a pleasure to mentor junior physicians who have chosen to uh, advance in the field of women's health, um, in, including one of my prides and joys, Katarzyna Bohenska from the University of Chicago. Uh, and we found each other, she found me, and I, it was a pleasure contributing to her professional career. And that's what we are all about at this point. It's mentoring, extending hands, we rode on other people's coattails, um, and I hope that we will continue to have the opportunity to advance the next generation of Polish Americans in their achievement in sciences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zaczynski. At this point, I guess that having uh, had an introduction to, uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dajinkiewicz to, uh, to uh, Jack Shostak, I guess can we briefly present uh, our uh, perhaps the most important person that uh, I would consider a uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Jack Shostak. He's a Canadian-American biologist of Polish and uh, British descent, and uh, he's professor of chemistry and chemical biology at the Harvard University, professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School, investigator of, at the Harvard Hughes Medical Institute, and Alexander A. Rich, distinguished in, investigator at Massachusetts General Hospital. 
Dr. Sostak had made significant contributions in the field of genetics. His discoveries made possible to map the location of genes in mammalian cells and to develop techniques for manipulating genes. They were also instrumental for mapping and identify, identifying genes of the human genome, both from the physical and functional standpoint. Along with Elizabeth Blackburn and uh, Karen, Carol Grinder, he was awarded a uh, 2009 year Nobel Prize for Physiology and or Medicine. The prize was bestowed for the discovery of molecular mechanisms that uh, are being uh, associated with uh, chromosomes, maintenance of the uh, stability of chromosomes during successive cell divisions, uh, and they are protected by the presence of telomeres. In addition to Nobel Prize, Dr. Shostak received numerous highly prestigious awards. They included uh, United States National Academy of Science Award in Molecular Biology, Hans Sigrid Prize from the University of Bern, Switzerland, Genetic Society of America Medal, and H.P. Heineken Prize in Biophysics and Biochemistry. Currently, Dr. Shostak research interests have become a focus on the challenges of understanding the origin of life on Earth and construction of artificial cellular life. This so exciting subject is being presented in the today's lecture, The Origins of Cellular Life. Uh, I cannot express how excited I am being able to listen to this uh, lecture. And so, as president of the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences uh, of America, it gives me great pleasure to present Professor Jack W. Shostak, uh, the 2019 Cosmere Funk uh, Natural Sciences Award in recognition of his outstanding uh, contribution to research uh, in the field of genetics. Uh, Professor Shostak, I will now turn over this virtual podium to you. Uh, for your remarks and your lecture, uh, The Origin of Cellular Life. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's a terrific uh, honor to receive this uh, award and, um, and to, to meet all of you. Uh, so uh, I first want to thank uh, uh, the, the Kostrzysko Foundation and the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences of America for um, uh, for the award and for organizing this uh, this this whole uh, event, uh, and and thank all of the the organizers and uh, uh, and also uh, Eva for uh, <laughs> helping to put together uh, this this uh, event. Um, I I also before I start on my lecture, I just uh, did want to. Uh, uh, echo something that uh, Helena said about uh, the breadth of science. It's it's really wonderful to be part of uh, an enterprise that goes all the way from the most fundamental inquiry to things that directly help um, people in their lives and health. And especially in these uh, very strange times, it's very nice to hear anything uh, supportive or based on evidence-based thinking. Uh, it's just very uh, refreshing and I hope that we get to hear a lot more evidence-based thinking in the, in the coming years. Uh, it's also, uh, of course, uh, uh, an honor to receive the Casimir Funk Award. Um, as you heard, um, uh, Professor Funk was the person who coined the term vitamins. Um, I, I guess at the time uh, it was thought that these uh, 
you know, unusual undiscovered uh, nutrients were all amines and uh, so it was originally you know, vital amines and then it was shortened to uh, vitamins when uh, people learned more about the molecules in question. Um, so I feel uh, kind of a, a tie to that because a lot of the work that we're doing is based on uh, trying to understand the fundamental uh, molecules of life and the molecules that, uh, that originally gave rise to life on, on the earth uh, uh, a long time ago. Uh, I just want to say uh, one more thing before I go in, into that uh, talk. Uh, it's particularly uh, nice for me to receive this uh, uh, this award because everybody here is either an immigrant or comes from immigrants and, and I think anything these days where there's so much anti-immigrant sentiment, anything that recognizes the importance of the people who've come to this country and helped to make it a great country, you know, that this kind of support is so important. And my lab in particular is extremely international. We have people from all over the world, including Poland. And um, it's extremely frustrating to me these days that it's getting harder and harder to bring in the best and brightest people from all over the world. And I certainly hope that uh, that situation uh, changes. But enough of that, let me now try to tell you uh, a little bit about what we've been doing um, and some of the work from uh, all these people uh, in, in, my, in my group. So let me try to share my screen here. And uh, let's see. Okay, so can everybody see this? Good, so does everybody know who this is? Uh, this is uh, uh, Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm uh, starting with this. So uh, obviously there is the Polish connection, but uh, uh, Copernicus uh, was an astronomer. And it actually turns out that uh, astronomy uh, has a very close connection to the subject that I'm interested in and that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is the origin of life. Uh, so Copernicus, of course, as you can see from the diagram in front of him, uh, was a person who, at least in terms of Western civilization, really uh, uh, set forth the organization of our uh, solar system. And now, 500 years later, uh, we uh, know a lot more and we're actually looking directly at other solar systems. And uh, so if I can advance. Hmm. There we go. This is the, a little uh, movie that is actually showing you planets rotating around another star. Um, and those planets are not like the Earth. Um, they're much bigger. They're more like Jupiter and they're very far away from their star. But I just wanted to show that as an example of how far we've come and how much we know and how much we're learning about uh, other planets out there in our galaxy and the universe. And, and so why is that important? Um, I think people have wondered, you know, from the beginnings of time, like, where did we come from? And corollary to that is a question uh, at the top here, you know, is, is there life out there or only here? And it's, that's a, actually not just a philosophical question, it's really directly related to what we're uh, interested in, which is trying to understand the origin of life. At the moment, of course, we only know of one example in the whole universe of, of life, and that's right here on Earth. Um, so because we only have one example, we don't know, we can't know if it's um, really easy for life to get started, uh, or if it's an incredibly rare event, a product of maybe many rare events. If we had one more independent example of an origin of life, meaning finding life on some other planet far away, that would say, well, it can't be that hard, right? All of the steps that go from star and planet formation to, to the 
um, creation of environments on, on planets around a suitable star, to all the chemistry that happens to the beginnings of life. It, it, if there was another example, we would feel confident that all of those steps um, mean that life can't, it can't be that hard to get life started. Okay, so uh, the whole field of astronomy has been transformed as, as people try to, to get um, evidence that there might or might not be life around some of these other planets. So we have had direct evidence for thousands of other solar systems at this point. Uh, and, and those numbers are growing by leaps and bounds as, as new as space telescopes come online. It will still probably be 10 or 20 or maybe even 30 years before we have some confidence um, that there might or might not be life out there. So in the meantime, you know, we can actually go into the lab and, uh, you know, think about things and do simple experiments. And by trying to reconstruct a pathway uh, through all of the sort of uh, chemical steps, at least, uh, we can try to get an idea if it's easy or hard for life to get started. Uh, and, and so that's why we're, we're very directly connected and, and actually talk a lot uh, with our colleagues in, in, in astronomy. There is another question, of course, that's related to this, which is, you know, if there is life out there, somewhere else in the universe. Is it going to be pretty much like what we're familiar with here on Earth? You know, what life that's based on chemistry going on in water and, and based on cells and, and, and so on? Or could there be very, very different kinds of life, maybe a very different chemical basis? Uh, so that's, that's kind of a harder question. Um, we're we're uh, dabbling uh, in that in the lab. If I live long enough, I, I hope to uh, to, to study that uh, more in the future. But for now, we're just trying to understand how life as we know it uh, got started. Okay. So you might wonder why this is such a hard problem. And I think a big part of it is, is just the way we think about these kinds of, uh, of scientific questions. And, and there's a lot of, uh, Kind of inherent biases in the way we think about things that can get in in the way and I, to me one of the biggest is that modern life is so complicated so in this beautiful image here uh, you can see a, a, a modern uh, eukaryotic cell undergoing division so there's dna and all of these structures inside the cell that control the movement of chromosomes and there's just an incredible amount of you know beautiful and complicated structure in modern cells and you know, underlying that is, is another layer of complexity. So uh, anybody who ever had to study metabolism in <laughs> college uh, probably had to struggle with learning some fraction of this horrible chart. Uh, but every cell on Earth, even the simplest bacterial cells, uh, have thousands of chemical reactions going on all the time, controlled and catalyzed by thousands of complicated enzymes. And all of this has evolved over billions of years. And, you know, it's just a, there's an incredible uh, chemical complexity to all of modern life. And that's not even the worst part. The hardest part of this complexity is comes when you look at the flow of information within modern cells. And uh, so what you're seeing here is basically this, the so-called central dogma, the flow of information from DNA, where information is archived, uh, through RNA, which serves many functions in cells, but uh, um, perhaps primarily as, a, as a, a, a messenger between the information in DNA to um, the R messenger RNA that's translated into proteins. And it's the proteins that do almost all of the, the work in our cells. They do the the enzyme catalysis, they build the structures and, and, and so on. So the problem is that every part of this uh, chain of events depends on every other part. So for example, you can't replicate DNA without help from RNA and proteins and the metabolites that are generated by enzymes. Similarly, you can't uh, make RNA uh, 
with a DNA and, and RNA itself and proteins that transcribe it and modify it and, and, and the same thing for protein. So every part of, of this underlying flow of information, this underlying structure depends on every other part. And that's, that's the fundamental conundrum that made it very hard for decades, uh, centuries, for people to think about how life could have gotten started. Um, when you have a system that's this self-referential, um, it, it's hard to imagine how all of these different parts could uh, emerge and, and work together you know, all at once. And of course, the answer is that that's not what happens, despite the fact that there were all kinds of crazy theories. There were a few smart people uh, in the late 60s who you know, were thinking about this kind of structure and realized that the molecule in the middle here, RNA, uh, plays this central role. And even back then, 60, 70 years ago, um, people knew that RNA could encode information um, and it was just being realized that RNA uh, could fold up and make three-dimensional shapes uh, the same way that proteins could. And so people like Francis Crick, uh, Leslie Orgel, uh, Carl Vos, uh, hypothesized that the origin of life might really have centered on, on RNA. And uh, so the idea is shown here. This is now called, this idea is called the RNA world. The idea that there's an early stage in the evolution of life before the emergence of DNA and proteins, uh, where RNA plays two roles. It plays the role of information carrier and it plays the role of uh, enzymes. So it could catalyze its own synthesis. It could do lots of things inside cells, make metabolites, for example. So you still have a cellular structure, but it's much, much simpler. And you don't have to worry about simultaneously bringing up RNA, DNA, proteins, and so on. Still, there's a big problem here, right? We have to go from underlying chemistry to uh, generating cell-like structures that contain RNA molecules that can actually do something useful. So it's still a huge uh, challenge. And I should say this model was not really taken seriously for quite a long time until uh, Tom Check and uh, Sidney Altman in the early 1980s discovered RNA molecules that actually could act like enzymes, that could catalyze chemical reactions. And after that, everybody just kind of focused in on this kind of uh, simplification, this idea that uh, the first cells to emerge would have been much, much, much simpler than anything we see today. And they would have been based on this kind of much simpler underlying organization with only one uh, informational biopolymer. And we just have to figure out how to get to this point. Okay. So uh, what do we know about um, when all these events were taking place? Um, so I just want to sketch an outline of the overall process. And so uh, this is a figure that I've modified from a review by my uh, friend and colleague, Jerry Joyce, uh, giving a bit of a timeline, uh, all, all of this a long time ago. Uh, so we know pretty accurately when the Earth uh, was formed, uh, when the, the uh, uh, moon forming impact occurred uh, roughly four and a half billion years ago. Uh, it probably took some tens of millions, maybe a hundred million year for years for the planet to cool down enough to have liquid water on the surface. Uh, and at that point, uh, the Earth was still a very different place uh, and still being bombarded by um, large asteroids and comets. It's a pretty, you know, violent um, and chaotic environment, but local areas where you could start to have uh, interesting chemistry going on. And so there's a, a, a very um, ill-defined time period in, in the middle here. We don't really know um, much about how long these events took. Uh, it could have been a short period, could have been taken tens or hundreds of millions of years. Uh, it could be that this kind of uh, early chemistry was going on in lots of different places all over the planet. 
most of the time it got wiped out by an impact or volcanic events and only eventually did a, the right things come together and give rise to life, which then colonized the planet. But after this sort of period of chemical evolution, we have the beginnings of the first RNA-based cells and then probably a period of very intense and rapid evolution to give us DNA, proteins, sort of all the machinery of, of modern cells. And then the diversification of life, which is, which continued for the next 4 billion years up to the present time and is, is still going on. So what we've been focusing on uh, is really this, this part in the middle in between uh, prebiotic chemistry that gives rise to the building blocks of simple cells. And we're trying to understand how these molecules come together, make RNA, make simple cells, and get the whole process of Darwinian evolution uh, off the ground and running. So in terms of what we're thinking of, uh, we're, we're looking at sort of three big questions. We, we want to understand the, what were the building blocks, the chemical building blocks of biology that were synthesized on the early, light, uh, on the early earth. And there are, there are quite a few labs working on this. Um, and then once you have the right chemical compounds though, then there's the question that's kind of the special interest of, of my group my lab, and that is, how do these chemicals come together and make something bigger that starts to act like a cell that can grow and divide and start to evolve? And, and so that's really our focus. And, and sort of going along with that is the really super important question of what kinds of environments uh, on the early earth could have supported uh, both the chemistry and um, these first cells. So uh, one thing that's been really important as the field develops and changes is bringing in uh, uh, geologists and geochemists and people who can really help us to think in a critical way about early environments. Okay, so uh, let me say a little bit about this early uh, period of the chemistry before there was life. And, and this is not gonna be an organic chemistry lecture, so don't worry. Uh, but I wanted to mention a key experiment that was done by Stanley Miller some, uh, what was it, almost 70 years ago now, uh, when he was a graduate student with uh, Harold Urey. And what uh, Stanley did was this iconic experiment where he uh, uh, put an electrical spark discharge through a mixture of gases that mimicked what people at the time thought the early Earth's atmosphere uh, looked like. And what he found was amazing was that in this huge mixture of compounds, there were amino acids. And in particular, uh, most of the amino acids that go to make the proteins um, that are found in all of our cells. So it was a stunning breakthrough at the time because here you have these iconic biological building blocks being made in an incredibly simple manner. And so I think that really initiated this the modern era of, of uh, origins of life uh, work. Now, since then, the field's developed a lot. And um, uh, this early experiment has, has kind of given way to, a, I would say, some new ways of thinking about the problem. Uh, so when you make molecules in this kind of uncontrolled way, the problem is that there are thousands. Well, the, the better your analytical instruments, the more molecules you can detect. There are probably tens of thousands of different molecules made here. And the ones that you need to build life are extremely rare in that complex mixture. So the way the field's been developing is to figure out ways of making pathways very efficient so that you get not a little bit of thousands of compounds, but a lot of just a few compounds and hopefully just the right compounds to start building cells. And so again, a lot of what's helped is not any kind of you know, revolution in, in um, the actual lab work. I mean, new instruments and better instruments always help, but it's really the limiting thing has been the way we think about these problems. Uh, and so, there, there are new sort of conceptual frameworks like this 
uh, term systems chemistry, which basically means, uh, you know, if you, if you want to do a chemical reaction, say take A and B and put them together and make product C, you know, if you're doing it in a lab, you can do it in a very controlled way. But often if you try to do that in a way that could happen on the early earth, it just doesn't work. Sometimes if you think about what other molecules would have been around and add those in, you know, it seems like you'd be making things messier and more complicated, but sometimes uh, it's really amazing. Reactions that didn't work at all turn out to be very efficient once you put in um, the right kind of extra ingredients, you know, things that could control the pH or act as simple catalysts. So that's really helped a lot. Uh, and it's helped us build up this uh, kind of uh, uh, picture that I find, uh, I, I kind of like it because it's a little bit ironic in that the best starting point to build life is cyanide. And cyanide is something that can be made in lots of different ways um, on young planets, um, from components in the atmosphere. And there are pretty efficient chemical pathways that will take you from cyanide to sugars, to nucleobases and nucleotides, to amino acids and peptides, and even to lipids. So you can make everything that you need to make life from uh, something that you know, we have to be pretty careful around these days, cyanide. OK, so um, let's see. Yeah, I just wanted to mention one one thing about, you know, how do you go from cyanide to something pretty complicated, like a nucleotide, a building block of RNA? And, and so the, you can't just mix stuff together in a tube and, and hope that nucleotides or RNA is going to come out. And one of the breakthroughs has been realizing that, you know, as you work out these pathways, sometimes there are intermediates that just want to crystallize out. And this beautiful crystal that you can see in the back is an intermediate on the way in between cyanide and RNA. So there you can imagine this building up in, in a pond or a lake in the early earth that sort of accumulates as a reservoir. And then when the conditions change, uh, the next step can go on. And so by, by breaking up a long pathway into sort of little chunks, you can actually work out how to make fairly complicated building blocks in, in an efficient way. OK, so let me just uh, jump ahead then and say, you know, if you'll accept that we could use this kind of chemistry, get the right molecules, then what? So this is kind of what we're trying to build in, in the lab. It's, it's a, this is a model of what we think a very simple primitive cell would have looked like. And like modern cells, there's a cell membrane made of simple lipids. So these can be just simple fatty acids. In other words, the molecules of soap. And inside, a simple genetic molecule, which we think is something like RNA, very close to DNA. Uh, so we actually can build structures like this. It, that turns out to be pretty easy. The harder part, the more interesting part, is how to make these things grow and divide. And so we can make the cell membrane, primitive model cell membrane, I should say, grow and divide in lots of different ways. And I'll show you a, a little bit about that. So uh, we've learned a lot about that in the last 10 years. Um, the harder part is to take these little bits of genetic molecules, things that can code for information and function, and have them uh, get copied and replicated and distributed to daughter cells. So that's a harder problem. Uh, and so that's actually most of what we're uh, working on in my lab at the moment. And I'll just say about that later. Okay, so uh, to just talk for a little bit about these uh, model cell membranes. Uh, uh, in the lab, we tend to use this molecule here, oleic acid. It comes from uh, olive oil. Uh, sometimes we use these other slightly simpler molecules. But all of these things, if you shake them up in water, you know, at a kind of, you know, where it's not too acid, not too basic, a little salt, they'll assemble into these beautiful uh, membrane structures, vesicles, we refer to them as. They look like, um, you know, they're similar in size to cells. 
Um, so, so they're very nice models of what primitive cells would have looked like. And it's just a spontaneous physical process. There's no, you know, complicated machinery required. Uh, so these vesicles have some really amazing properties that uh, I just really like. So I wanted to show you a couple of experiments. What was done here was to make uh, two separate uh, tubes full of vesicles and label one with a green dye and one with a red dye and then mix them together. And as you can see, they stay separate. So these vesicles maintain their separate identity uh, for days and for weeks. We know from other experiments that the molecules that make up these membranes exchange between vesicles on a time scale of seconds. So you know, from minute to minute, these vesicles are made of different collections of molecules, but they still maintain their, their own identity. So just as we, as, as, uh, as, as humans, you know, we, we, you know, we eat food um, uh, from year to year, the molecules that make us up are different molecules, but we maintain our separate identity. In, the, here's a, a, a totally different kind of experiment where we're using a, a clay mineral, uh, which uh, we found could help these vesicles to assemble a little bit faster. Other people had shown that the same clay mineral could help to assemble RNA molecules. Uh, and so what you see in this orange uh, region is a clay particle that has RNA molecules on its surface. And this clay particle has helped to assemble uh, these small vesicles that are trapped inside this, this large uh, outer uh, membrane. So it's interesting because here you have a very simple mineral that's very common, very easy to make. It can help to make this genetic material, RNA. It can help to make membranes and it can help to bring them together. So it's very intriguing in terms of how mineral particles might have helped to assemble the first cells. Okay. So I want to show you uh, one more uh, vesicle experiment. And this is something, this is work that was done by Anna Huang when she was a postdoc uh, in the lab. Uh, so again, these are these simple uh, vesicles made of soap-like molecules. And what Anna uh, figured out is that she can add more of these uh, molecules to these uh, vesicles and they get absorbed into the membrane surface. The surface grows and then the shapes start to fluctuate and you see they spontaneously start to divide into smaller vesicles. So this is again is showing that growth and division is something that's a, it's a consequence of simple um, physical processes. You don't even need any complicated evolved machinery for these kinds of things to happen. So we think that the first cells um, would have grown and divided because of the simple underlying um, chemistry and physics and processes that are driven by the environment. Okay, so now I just want to talk a little bit about uh, RNA because that's the key molecule inside that has to code for information and hopefully code for useful functions that help the cell to, to adapt to its environment and, and, and become more complex and more competitive. Uh, so here's an experiment that I like, again, because it's very uh, sort of counterintuitive. Uh, and so in this uh, experiment, uh, what's been done is to take building blocks of RNA that are uh, chemically activated uh, so they can uh, join together to make long chains. Uh, RNA is a, a, a sort of long polymeric uh, molecule. Now, normally when you want a chemical reaction to go on, you would heat it up. So things uh, run in, molecules uh, bounce into each other more often with more energy and they tend to react more. In this case, that doesn't work. If you take these activated nucleotides, these building blocks, and uh, warm them up or just leave them at room temperature, nothing happens. They, they actually start to fall apart. But if you put them in the freezer, 
then over uh, days and weeks, they join together and they might make longer and longer and longer molecules. So the, in here, these shorter molecules are at the bottom and the longer ones at the top. So why this works is shown here. This is an electron, uh, I mean, a fluorescence uh, microscope image of a frozen material. And the dark regions are pure water ice crystals. And in between, are all the things that were dissolved in the water. So they've become very concentrated as the pure water ice crystals grow. And because they're so concentrated, they bump into each other and they start to react and grow these long chains of RNA. Okay, so making RNA doesn't look that hard once you have the right building blocks, uh, but copying it, replicating it, has been a challenge for over 60 years now. And so what I want to do is show a movie. This is a video animation that was made by Janet Iwasa from my lab years ago. And it shows what we're trying to accomplish. We have an RNA strand here floating around in a very rich chemical environment. And these uh, nucleotide building blocks find their partners on the original strand by Watson Crick base pairing and click together to build up a double helix. Okay, so when you see a movie like that, it looks easy, but actually getting this to work in an efficient way uh, in the lab uh, and in a way that you, know, you could imagine it working on the early earth has been a really, really difficult uh, chemical challenge. Uh, and some of the problems are listed here. Uh, so for decades, this kind of chemistry, you know, people tried all kinds of tricks and variations and it was always too slow. And you might think, well, what's, what's the problem? You know, we've got a couple hundred million years for life to get started, things can be slow, right? But unfortunately, that's, that's not right uh, because RNA is a very delicate molecule. In fact, it's always gonna be falling apart uh, in water. And, and so you've got to copy it, you've got to replicate it faster than it falls apart. So there's a kind of threshold of activity that we need. And it was very hard to overcome that barrier. And I, I think we're there now. I think some of the advances that uh, have come out of our work in the last few years have, have mostly solved that problem. Similarly, we're, the reason you want to copy RNA or replicate it is to replicate the information. And if you make too many mistakes in doing that, copy in chemistry, then it's not good for anything. So for a long time, the copying wasn't accurate enough. Now we've discovered several pretty simple ways of making it more accurate. Uh, so we're pretty happy that we may have at least mostly solved this problem. There's a whole bunch of other problems here. And I can't say that we've completely solved all of them but I think we're getting very, very close. Um, many of these problems we've, we've figured out workarounds or, um, or solutions based on kinds of chemistry that actually could have happened on the, on the early earth. So we're getting close to thinking about uh, how replication uh, could have happened. And, uh, I'm sort of getting to the end here, but I wanted to talk about one, one thing from my lab that I, I'm actually pretty excited about um, that's come out just over the last uh, couple of years. And so there's been a puzzle that uh, we and many people have been thinking about for years, which is that the, when you have these uh, building blocks of RNA being made just by chemistry, on the early earth, it's just not realistic to think that you would only get the molecules you want to make just RNA and put them together in just the right way. So what we're seeing here in this diagram is the blue would be the so-called ribonucleotides that will make RNA, but you're almost certainly gonna make related molecules. Um, Two very close relatives are arabinonucleotides and threonucleotides, where the sugar part is a little different. And it turns out you would probably also have deoxynucleotides, which are the building blocks of DNA. 
And all of these things would be mixed together as a result of the chemistry going on in a favorable environment. And these things can come together and make short chains, but they'd be very messy, a really heterogeneous mixture of different kinds of building blocks. And that's a big problem because those kinds of heterogeneous polymers are not going to be able to reproducibly fold up uh, make three-dimensional shapes that can do useful things like catalyze chemical reactions. So the problem is, how do you get something more like modern RNA, more homogeneous, out of this really messy starting mixture? And so what we've been doing over the last several years, and especially Chris uh, Kim and many other people in the lab, been looking at this by, by thinking that, well, you make these short chains, every now and then they can come together with a little bit of base pairing to make a little double helical region. And then you could build off these chains and grow them. And it turns out that when you do that, RNA always wins. These other things always get incorporated much more slowly. Uh, whereas the RNA components, the ribonucleotides, get inserted, they can, the chain can grow by growing as RNA much faster than anything else. So we think if you go through sort of cycles of these things coming together, making a little bit of RNA, coming apart, doing this again and again, after cycle after cycle, you'll end up with chains that are basically looking like modern RNA. So it's been very satisfying to have a chemical and physical explanation of how you can start with a mess and get something that's really beautifully uh, homogeneous and much closer to what we see in modern biology. Okay, so I just wanted to show a, a kind of conceptual model of how we think of the environment um, essentially driving um, the growth and division of very primitive cells like this. So we're thinking about environments kind of like uh, volcanic areas or impact craters. Might have been cold most of the time. So you could think of something like Lake Yellowstone in the winter pond or lake covered with ice. But because there's um, hot rock or magma underneath, you have these vents that give streams of hot water. And, and so these primitive cells could be in the cold water most of the time and doing some synthesis, growing their RNA chains, doing uh, useful chemistry. Every now and then they get swept up in a stream of hot water that will help the RNA strands come apart, uh, rearrange, uh, help more nutrients come across the membrane, then they get swept out into the cold water and and you can go through this cycle again and again. So it's a way in which we think the environment basically controls what's going on. And so I just wanted to end by uh, um, talking a little bit about, you know, how, how do we think about these primitive environments? You know, the early earth is very different uh, than what we have now, but there are places like Yellowstone, volcanic areas that are a way to educate ourselves about surface environments that could be similar to places where early life evolved. And uh, so we do field trips. Um, <laughs> we have a uh, um, uh, Harvard, uh, hello? Someone have a question? Okay, uh, we have these do these field trips. So a couple of years ago, we went to Yellowstone, and I just want to say uh, uh, this is uh, Lydia, who's a chemistry student in my lab, uh, Yaya, who's a geology student in a different lab, and uh, Zoe, who's an astronomy student. So we have all these people from different branches of science, and we get together and try to uh, go to environments and, and talk to each other and learn about the origin of life uh, from a, a sort of that geological perspective. And then I just want to end by saying that all the work that we're doing in my lab has been done, you know, not, not by me, but by fantastic students and, and postdocs, yeah. uh, some of whom, uh, a small fraction of whom are, are shown here. Uh, so I want to thank them uh, for contributing to uh, 
all of the fantastic results and uh, just uh, close by again thanking the Kosciuszko uh, uh, Foundation and the Polish Institute for the award and for the chance to share uh, our work uh, with everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very interesting lecture. And now we're turning to our audience for questions. Uh, just as a reminder, you have this Q&A feature uh, on the bottom of your screen, so please use it to ask a question. And I have a first question from Helen Grebski. As a layperson, where do T cells come into evol evolutionary process, especially in terms of the epidemiological issues that are faced that we are facing today? Yeah, so the uh, so that's at a very much later stage of evolution. Uh, what we're looking at here are just the very beginnings of life, much simpler than even any of the, the simplest bacteria on Earth today. And so uh, we think that you know Darwinian evolution, acting over uh, billions of years, has given rise to progressively more uh, complicated and sophisticated organisms, such as, for example, us. Uh, and, and so we have lots of different kinds of cells that do lots of different kinds of things, but these are products of uh, more recent evolutionary events. This is from the audience. Uh, Lucia, did you have a chance to name any new compound that you discovered with a Polish name? <laughs> Um, so I can't say that, that uh, we have, we, we uh, yeah, we're usually limited to just, you know, kind of standard or rules of organic chemistry. Uh, uh, sometimes in chemistry, people will name reactions after uh, uh, people, um, uh, but yeah, sorry, we haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> Question from Christina. I used to work with Dr. Altman, Altman's lab uh, and RNA interactions with proteins were important for RNA stabilization. Is that what you are finding? That's a very interesting question. So um, um, we are trying to understand how um, proteins came into the picture Presumably, they started off as like very small pieces, little peptides that might have done something useful, maybe working together with RNA to stabilize a structure or to provide chemical groups that, that help with the function. Um, it, it's really, that's a, a frontier of research, both in our lab and, and many others. We, we, Everybody knows there has to be some simple way that peptides came into the picture and started doing something useful. But I don't think anyone's really figured that out yet. It's something we're thinking about and working on a lot. From Magdalena, since RNA is a precursor molecule of life, could you please comment on the, of the origin of the RNA viruses? Oh, the origin, origin of RNA viruses. Yes, that's another very interesting question. Um, so, yeah, I could, let's see, maybe I can rephrase that as, you know, um, would RNA viruses be a more recent product of evolution? So say since we had things like modern bacteria. So modern bacteria have many RNA viruses, RNA bacteriophage. Could you have had viruses earlier back in the RNA world? And that's an open question. Viruses have to be able to get into cells, take them over and get out and infect new cells. And it's not obvious to me uh, how that could have happened before you had you know, more sophisticated proteins to do some of those functions. So I'm not really sure. Uh, we, we definitely know that parasitic RNAs 
can evolve in RNA evolution experiments. That's been known for a long, long time. And so you could have parasitic RNAs that kind of escaped from their cell and maybe in rare events got into other cells and propagated that way. Um, so that could be an early sort of stage in the evolution of RNA viruses. Uh, but yeah, very interesting uh, thing to think about. Mohammed, did the environment completely lack proteins or other macromolecules? So I think when you say proteins, usually we think of um, uh, uh, macromolecules that are made um, by ribosomes so that they have a defined amino acid sequence. So that is a very complicated process, right? And, and is a product of a long period of evolution. There are hundreds of components that are required to do that. So early cells and, and before life, there would have been nothing like that. But this very simple chemistry, in fact, many different chemical pathways that can hook up amino acids together to make peptides, not in a sequence defined way, but you could have some constraints on the composition uh, depending on the environment. So you could have much simpler, smaller progenitors of proteins and related, then the question goes back to that earlier question is could those actually do anything useful? And that is something nobody knows yet. From Lucia, is light absolutely necessary for the beginning of life? And this one will be answered by Dr. Zuczynski, as I see, correct? <laughs> I was trying to type a question. I didn't okay. To answer that. <laughs> okay, so, so we, we are going back to Dr. Shostak. <laughs> Please. So is, is light absolutely necessary for the beginning of life? Is light, light necessary? Light. Yeah, yeah, light. yeah, so that's a very interesting question. So, uh, so one of the theories of the origin of life that you might hear a lot about in the popular press is, is that life started in these, you know, deep, uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents, right, where there's some very interesting chemistry that goes on, but there's no light. And um, to my way of thinking, that's a terrible place. It's impossible for life to start there because you actually do need light to drive the chemical reactions that are needed to make molecules like nucleotides and RNA. And in fact, all of the building blocks of life, uh, I think the, the pathways that have been worked out that are the most satisfying begin with ultraviolet radiation driving the chemistry. So I think you need a surface environment where you have exposure to the light of the early sun that provides energy uh, to make the molecules that are needed to build up the first simple cells. May I ask a question? Where in the evolution, um, this timeline that you are creating, do prions fit in? Oh, yeah. So prions are, you know, a very interesting way in which you can have kind of simple inheritance uh, because proteins can form different conformations that can be <laughs> propagated. Uh, so, um, and, so, and from a clinical perspective, for those of you who don't know about prions, they're what, the slow viruses that we have great concerns over, the deer wasting disease, the Jakob Kurzfeld. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're very important uh, clinically. Yeah, very dangerous. Um, but very simple peptides can form aggregates that have a structural similarity to what you see in prions. Uh, so I would say, you know, they could have come into being as soon as you had a coded protein synthesis. Um, there are even some people thinking about how these um, uh, particular peptide structures might have been able to catalyze their own synthesis, their own replication. Um, so that's an interesting area of research, but I think more likely is that once you have uh, cells that can make proteins. Some of those proteins will form prion-like aggregates. 
And in fact, we now know that many of those, they're, they're not all bad, right? M many prion type aggregates perform uh, useful, even essential functions in cells. Uh, so it's, you know, it's like one of those things you see a lot in biology where there are trade-offs, you know, something may be doing something good, but then it can get um, diverted into a pathogenic uh, uh, direction. Um, yeah, so yeah, great question. Magdalena, uh, that was my question. Were the RNA self-replicating structures before vesicles or after? Uh, before or after vesicles. So the, I like to think that all of these things emerged at the same time. Uh, from the kinds of the, 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 the chemical pathways that are being worked out, um, like in large part by my colleague, John Sutherland, all of these things could happen uh, at more or less the same time and in, in environments that would have been very close together. So I think that um, uh, vesicles are very easy to make, uh, RNA is harder to make, but they easily could you know, come together and you'd have vesicles that contained RNA. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a period where one came before the other. It's really bringing them together that where interesting things start to happen. Question from Gary from UK. Have you found in vivo evidence of the processes you have described in geothermal vents on the deep ocean floor or is the technology to examine uh, this is not available yet? Uh, so, I'm not exactly sure what um, the question's getting at. Uh, what I could say is that the chemistry that we're looking at cannot go on on the earth today. The, the environment is so different, right? We have oxygen in the atmosphere uh, that would, that would, um, that blocks most UV light from coming, coming down to the surface. Uh, so all these kinds of early prebiotic chemistry can't go on anymore. And even if there are places where you could make uh, useful uh, sort of building blocks of biology, maybe in some different way, they would be eaten up immediately because life is everywhere uh, on our planet. Um, so we're not gonna see you know, new origins of life going on uh, on the planet today. Uh, would, not, would not the pa parasitic RNAs be like uh, the gene transfer uh, we see between my uh, microorganism today? So uh, gene transfer, uh, especially between bacteria is a very important process in evolution and it can speed up evolution enormously. Uh, so that's something we're really, really interested in. You know, how early could that happen? Are, are there simple ways that molecules could go from one vesicle to another? Uh, and uh, so we and, and several other labs are very interested in that uh, because if there, if there are ways of doing gene transfer uh, early on, it, it could have uh, sped up the early phases of evolution enormously. Another question from Christina. Does your work explain why the upcoming mRNA COVID vaccines have to be kept at minus 80 degrees? <laughs> well, RNA, like I said, RNA is a delicate molecule, right? And, and so these RNA-based vaccines um, uh, generally have to be kept uh, uh, frozen if you, you know, want to store them or ship them for longer than a week or so. Um, yeah, RNA is just inherently uh, much more delicate than, than DNA. Uh, and so um, that's why we think that the, the early chemical pathways for the copying and the replication of RNA had to be reasonably fast and efficient. They had to outcompete this natural tendency of RNA to fall apart. Any more questions? So. Thank you so much. Thank you for this interesting lecture. Special thanks to our participants and the audience. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so, for organizing. So this. we're coming to, to an end. Thank you so much.
Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.